what did it take to be someone like Ada Lovelace who discovered that calculating was not simply equations, but was algorithms, a set of instructions? I think that the main thing she had in a larger sense was the ability to connect the arts to the sciences, you know, what we do here on this stage all the time, the humanities to engineering. As you know, her father, Lord Byron, the poet, was a Luddite. And I mean that literally because the only speech he gives in the House of Lords is defending the followers of Ned Ludd who are smashing the mechanical looms in England thinking it's going to put weavers out of work. Uh, but Ada went on a trip to the Midlands, saw the mechanical looms, saw the way punch cards were instructing the looms to do beautiful patterns. And she was friends with Babbage, as you said, and he was making his calculating machine doing numbers. And she realized that the punch cards can make it, so as she put it, because she publishes, which is unusual for a woman in the uh, 1830s, to publish a pe scientific paper on Babbage's machine saying that because of the punch cards and other things, it can do anything that can be notated in symbols, not just numbers, but it can do words, it can, do, it can weave tapestries as beautiful as the Jacquard loom, she writes, and it could even make music, something that would have caused Lord Byron to flinch. The but what she's seeing there is exactly what John von Neumann sees. Bingo. Uh, the general uh, purpose uh, computer, and Alan Turing <laughs> sees it. That, that, there is, that symbols are agnostic. They, right. don't, they don't depend on violins, they don't depend on typewriters, they don't depend on the machines that make them. Symbols have a life of their own. And you can manipulate them logically. <laughs> and then the cool thing that comes along, which is not obviously Ada, but comes along 100 years later, is people like Claude Shannon and others who take Boolean algebra, which was you know, devised around the time of Ada Lovelace, and says, okay, we can use circuits to do on-off switches that can do the logic basically. And that's when all of a sudden machines seem to think. One of the things that Ada says at the end of her notes on the analytical engine, machines will do everything. They'll do music. They'll do this, that, and the other. And then she says, but they will never think. They will never originate thought. They will never be imaginative. It'll take the human partnership with the machine to originate thought. And that's what Alan Turing, 100 years later, calls Lady Lovelace's objection and says, how would we know that? And he comes, you all will see the uh, movie in about three or four weeks, I'm sure, called The Imitation Game, which is about Turing doing it. And he devises what he calls The Imitation Game, we call The Turing Test, where he says, how would we know a machine can't think? What if, what if we can't tell a machine apart from a human in its answers? Then there's no reason to say the machine's not thinking. What kind of a character is Turing? And compare him to the people who were more involved in the building of the machines that could do what Turing imagined would be the test of intelligence. Yeah, Turing was very much of a theorist and a mathematician. And, and a loner. And a loner, and uh, homosexual at a time when if you're in the MI6 government service trying to break the German Enigma codes in England coming out of the Victorian era is not that easy to be, but he was also not ashamed of being homosexual. So it's a very complicated thing. Uh, but the main thing is he comes up with the notion of the universal computing machine, something that can do any form of life. I mean, anything that any machine could do, you know, a universal machine can do that type of logic. And so that becomes a foundation for von Neumann and others who turn it into an architecture for computers. But one of the things that struck me just at that point in the book, although Steve Jobs had turned me on to the idea earlier and it began to sink in, was it isn't just the visionary who does something. You have to have a team that then starts to implement it. And so uh, Turing is this great logical theoretician, but because it's wartime and they gotta break the German codes, he's thrown in with Tommy Flowers, who worked for the phone company mm -hmm. in Britain, and knew how, uh, how vacuum tubes, or valves as they called them in England, how vacuum tubes work. And, you know, there are mechanics and there's people who do cross... People get hired at Bletchley Park by doing the telegraph crossword puzzle really well. So you have all sorts of interesting people working on the teams. So he goes to Bletchley Park, this secret, um, you know, facility they have in England to break the German wartime codes. That machine there is an Enigma machine, which codes the German messages Fortunately, I think the Polish intelligence originally captured one, and so they're able to slowly break how the code is done. 
But one of the amazing things that Turing does at Bletchley is figure out, along with Tommy Flowers, who knew how to use vacuum tubes and worked for the phone company over there, how you would make something called Colossus, which is the first real electronic operable computer, and they use it to break the uh, German code. So when we argue about what is the first computer, one contender, if you're thinking it's got to be electronic, it's got to work, you know, it's got to do logical sequences, it probably ought to be digital. Uh, Colossus breaking the code that was done on that machine by Turing and the whole team there uh, at Bletchley Park, and especially Tommy Flowers and some others. All right, so um, what is the team in the United States that invents the computer, and there were many teams around the world, but what is the team that yeah. you focus on, and right. what was the tension between throwing out the rule book and, and uh, really sticking to some sort of very linear tradition in the military hierarchy? Yeah, well, actually, there's two places you could say the computer was invented in the United States. We biographers know that we distort history a little bit. We give a little too much credit to the lone inventor who in the basement of the garage comes up with a light bulb moment and innovation occurs. And if you're a romantic historian or if you're Jane Smiley, the novelist, or somebody like that, you pick out John Vincent Atanasoff, who at Iowa State University makes a circuit, a electronic logical circuit, and is able to invent the first electronic circuit board. Now, he's a loner, and so it's kind of romantic. He has one graduate student, but no team around him. So he can't really get it working. He can't get the punch card burner to work. And when he goes into the Navy, they don't even know what this contraption is he's been building, and they dismantle it and throw it away. You have another team that's just the opposite, led by John Mockley. John Mockley was one of these people who loves being at places like this. He loved wood-paneled explorers clubs and Carnegie Institutes and Smithsonian's and science festivals and historical societies. He was part of that British-American cadre of people who love sharing science. He goes all over the place because he wants to build a computer, and he's like a bumblebee. He picks up pollen in places and cross-pollinates things. So he goes to the 1939 World's Fair and sees what they're doing. He goes to Dartmouth with us. Bell Labs has a Stibitz machine. He goes to Harvard and MIT where Vannevar Bush had done a uh, non-digital and analog machine. So he picks up all these things, and he finally hears this guy in Iowa State. He actually runs into him in Philadelphia, and for four days he drives to Iowa State with his kid just so he can see the computer. So then he comes back to Penn, and unlike Adonassoff, he builds a team. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, the building of the team is the important thing. He gets Presper Eckert, who uh, is a great engineer. He gets, you know, mechanics, people with grease under their fingernails. He has 70 people. They're building this room, so I think. And he gets about 70 women PhDs in math who are doing the calculations. He picks six of them to secretly get training at Aberdeen Proving, uh, Proving Ground to reprogram the computer. They understand the innards of the computer. When John von Neumann comes from Los Alamos and needs to have the machine not do ballistic missile trajectories, but to do a test of a hydrogen-type bomb, uh, the, it's the women who reprogram it. What is it intuitively about this team of women that, that understands programming and these sets of instructions and how interchangeable they are. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, women have unfortunately been written out of the history of computing a little bit more than they should have been, and these women are not as well known as they should be. But more women got PhDs in math in the 1930s than in the 50s or the 60s. It was before women had been told by our friends that they didn't know how to do math or something. And so women were great mathematicians, and they also were more collaborative. I don't mean to get into a gender thing, about it, but, but they all worked together, and so they did open source of COBOL, all these programming they languages, Hopper, it's Grace big... Hopper's working, what? They ask for directions. Right, right. I'm trying very hard not to step in any landmines, but you're allowed yeah, to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's another one, which is boys with their toys, you think the hardware is the cool thing. You know, they're like me. They like soldering things, and they, they think the hardware is the big thing, and figuring out how to program it, you know, that's menial. The women can do that. They don't realize that after a while, ENIAC and UNIVAC and Honeywell and Sperry Rand and whatever types of computers are, those can be interchangeable. 
it's the actual programming language that's going to be the real value. You don't particularly care which piece of hardware you're using. So the women did the programming back then, both Lieutenant Grace Hopper at Harvard, doing it with um, Howard Aiken on the Mark I, and then the six women of ENIAC, led by Gene Jennings. And uh, Jennings and Hopper are a fascinating story. Yeah, they really are. You know, one of the things I'll give a thing about Jennings that struck me, Jean Jennings is from Atlantis Grove, Missouri, a town of like 108. She's one of seven kids or eight kids or whatever, poor farm family who really loved education. So she decides she wants to be a mathematician. She couldn't decide between journalism and math, and she made the right choice, became a mathematician, and went to Northwest Missouri State College for $78 a year. And so she became... And then on her last month there, she sees an ad that says, come to Philadelphia, we need women mathematicians to work in ENIAC. There she is, yep. So, uh, it would be illegal to yeah. run that ad today. We need yeah, it to actually said, well, it says uh, women wanted, you know, because it was making yeah. fun of the men wanted sort of thing, but most, it was 44, yeah, yeah. men were off at war. So she gets on the train at midnight from Atlantis Grove and arrives in Philadelphia 40 hours later, has the job, but I did look up Northwest um, Missouri, Missouri State, State yeah. It's now $14,000 a year. We're going to lose a generation of people who could go to college for $78 a year and become the pioneer programmer of her generation. Hmm. So uh, these women, uh, not Rosie the Riveters, but Rosie the Coders, mm -hmm. um, begin to develop enough programs that the thought begins to converge now that, that machines are interchangeable, that the software can evolve to more sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, capabilities, and that... The, the pure hardware is not necessarily the measure of what these things can do. It's a, it's, a, it's a partnership between more sophisticated software and more capacity hardware. Right, because at first these machines are built for special purposes. Colossus, which is the one that Tommy Flowers and Alan Turing work on at Bletchley Park, is there just to break the German code. Likewise, the ENIAC, which you saw back there, the women programming it, um, that was mainly done for ballistic missile right. artillery tables. Right. But they discover, oh, the war is ending, and we needed to do atom bomb tests and sonar and you know, sonic waves and everything else. So it's the first one that's really reprogrammable. And then John von Neumann comes along and says, we can store the programs in the memory of the machine. And that's when you really get a real computer. So I think of ENIAC as the first real computer, because it's programmable, it's general purpose. And it's really cool. Typically, you know, we all collaborate. We all take ideas from one another. Steve Jobs goes to Xerox Park. Bill Gates buys, you know, looks at the first Macintosh. Everybody's taking each other's ideas. And then, of course, Apple sues Microsoft. Well, not surprisingly, there was like 15 years of a lawsuit because after ENIAC is built, it becomes UNIVAC in its commercial form. Univac becomes Unisys, Sperry ran, they start enforcing the uh, patents on it, at which point Honeywell wants to break the patents, and it goes and finds Adam Asoff, who's retired. And he says, yeah, that guy came and visited me. He took my ideas. So for 15 years, you have a lawsuit over who deserves the uh, patents. In the end, the court ruled against the ENIAC people, but didn't award the patent to anybody, which is probably correct because it was a collaborative thing. We have a trustee, Gordon Bell, very famous yeah. figure in computer history, oh. who calls that lawsuit the disinvention of the computer. Right, exactly. You know, uh, with all due respect to the lawyers in the room, it's best not to leave the whole notion of historical invention to copyright lawsuits. There's a wonderful one, of course, where Jack Kilby in, at Texas Instruments and Bob Noyce and... Gordon Moore, who are pictured in your lobby here, they almost simultaneously do the microchip. And that's a huge lawsuit for many years, but Noyce and Kilby were both such decent people. They always gave each other the credit. And before the lawyers could settle, the, I mean, that suit went on and on and on, on appeal. Finally, Noyce and the Texas Instruments people just got together and said, shook hands and said, let's cross-license yeah. each other's yeah. patents. Let's get the lawyers out of this. All right, so let's move on. You you mentioned the semiconductor earlier, and I want to talk now about the transistor and the integrated circuit, but I want to talk about it to draw a contrast 
the way that you explain the way teams and collaboration happen, mm -hmm. and by contrasting two very different approaches. Right. One is the Shockley mm -hmm. approach and his team yeah. working on the transistor on the one hand, and then Noyce and Moore in the integrated circuit on the other. Talk a bit about Shockley, um, the genius inventor, but the really yeah, formidable Shockley, personality. Yeah, Shockley, of course, you all know about, a genius, but also paranoid and eventually racist. So he's at Bell Labs, which is by far the coolest place for collaboration in the 1930s and 40s. And throughout the mid to late 40s, they have to figure out how to do many things, one of which is amplify a phone signal so you can make a call from San Francisco to New York. And they need a solid state amplifier. You can't do it with vacuum tubes. And so Shockley is leading the solid state team at Bell Labs. I love Bell Labs because it's the ultimate of you know, a place-based collaboration where um, in the hallways there, you have this guy, Claude Shannon, I talked about, who figures out information there. You have John Bardeen, who's a quantum theorist. You have Shockley, who's a great physicist. But they're sharing a workspace, or Bardeen is, and a bench with Walter Bratton, who's an experimentalist. He knows how to take a piece of silicon, which, as you know, is a semiconductor that you can dope with impurities and make it conduct better or worse, and therefore be an on-off switch, therefore be a solid state amplifier. And the, they understand the surface state, too, which understands, which means understanding both quantum theory, but also material science, like what's happening to those, you know, um, electrons dancing in the surface state of a uh, piece of silicon. And so they're doing all these things. Bardeen and Bratton, almost do a call and response, like there's a librettist and a, you know, a composer at a bench doing a song, uh, as they figure out ways to make um, the various materials they're using into better semiconductors, and even using a paper clip to jam through the surface state. They're working under Shockley. They finally do it. Shockley has contributed many of the theories, but he's been a bit hands off. But Unlike the heroes of this book, he doesn't like giving credit as much as he likes taking credit. So even, I mean, he's furious when they are put on the application for the, um, uh, they're put on the application for the um, uh, patent for it, and he insists that he be in all the press releases. He even insists, I'm not sure you can see it, that in the publicity photos, he be, he be in it, he, he, he gets to be in it. And just as they were taking this photo at Bell Labs for the publicity shot, they were all standing up, he sits down and grabs Bar um, Bratton's microscope, as if it's his, and makes himself the center. And both Bardeen and Bratton said they hated this photograph from then on. They don't speak to each other for a while. Shockley gets eased out of Bell Labs because he's such a pain to work for. The only time they really speak is when they win the Nobel Prize and they all meet in the hotel room that evening and they're both in the same, you know, restaurant and they forgive each other. But uh, Shockley comes out here, very nearby, starts Shockley's semiconductor and is just as paranoid and hard at building teams. So none of the people at Bell Labs will come work with him, but he calls Bob Noyce, he calls Gordon Moore because he's heard of these young engineers, gathers them to work at Shockley uh, semiconductor but after a while, um, they just can't stand working for Shockley. And the pictures you have downstairs in the lobby of Noyce, Moore, and others, and those notebooks of Fairchild Semiconductor are because Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore decided the way to run a company is not this authoritarian, uh, bossy, you know, glory-hogging way that, um, that uh, Shockley has been doing it. And they start Intel where they have a room almost like this, not too far from here, just a big room. Nobody has a corner office. And Noyce puts a beat up desk right in the center of the room along with uh, Moore and others. And there's no hierarchy in it. Invents not only the microchip, but what they invent is the Silicon Valley culture of that sort of open, non-authoritarian, non-hierarchical company.
We had Gordon here for the 50th yeah. anniversary of I the I love driving up you, uh, to uh, Woodside and just sitting there and listening to him. Isn't, that, isn't yeah. that fantastic? Yeah. And someone asked him about what it was like to work for Shockley, and he said, yeah, it's true. He was a difficult guy to work for, but he seemed to be a pretty good judge of talent. <laughs> That's probably the only egotistical thing Gordon Moore said. <laughs> and he probably didn't mean it to be egotistical, but he was right. I don't think he was talking about himself, actually, oh. but, uh, or intending to, but it certainly got the same laugh as everybody uh, yeah. gave us tonight. So let's launch ahead to really when the convergence becomes complete, because suddenly with solid state electronics and uh, the ability to kind of home engineer enough computer capability to begin to program on your own, mm -hmm. suddenly we're in the realm of Gates and Jobs and the Apple gang. Well, you talked about, I think, you know, I was listening from the back, uh, the sort of that cultural brew in the early 1970s. And, you know, you have everybody from the hippies to the anti-war protesters to the hobbyists and hackers and electronics geeks and stuff like that. So uh, what happens in around in the early 1970s is the hobbyist comes first. Ed Roberts creates the Altair, which right. does almost absolutely nothing. It just has a few lights that blinks and a few switches and you can do it. Uh, but since it all comes back to good product launches, he gets himself on the cover of Popular Electronics and, and sends the Altair on the road to the Homebrew Computer Club, which is where all these, you know, hackers and geeks are all coming together in the early 70s. Now, a couple things happen. It's on the cover of Popular Electronics, and this guy, Bill Gates, who's a sophomore at Harvard, has convinced this friend of his, Paul Allen, to drop out of school and move to Boston for no apparent reason, because he's, you know. And Paul Allen, in that out-of-town newsstand right in Harvard Square, sees Pop it says the Altair, grabs a copy, pays 75 cents, and runs to Courier House, where Bill Gates is living, and plops it down and says, this is happening without us. And Gates just starts rocking, as he used to do, or still does probably, and says, oh my God, and it's exam period. And he blows off all four of his exams, and they just sit there on a defense department paid for computer at the Aiken Computer Lab, where Grace Hopper and right, Howard Aiken right, had right. worked, and they code uh, BASIC. So, or early 70s, is, is this the machine that Gates takes home to, or something like it, that he takes home to uh, begin to develop basic? Yeah, so they develop, this is it, I mean, the original Altair, and um, Gates sits there at Harvard and they do basic. Uh, since Gates can't even shave yet, I mean, he's, you know, he's like, looks like a Cub Scout. Uh, they send Paul, who actually has sideburns at that point, to fly to Albuquerque to make the sale of basic for the Altair. And so that's where that- Zuckerberg happened. didn't have that problem. No, no, oh, no. no. Uh, <laughs> but what happens is, as I say, they take the Altair on the road, they bring it to the Homebrew Computer Club. Da Steve Dompier, who's you know, one of these hippie geeks, says, okay, I can make it do Fool on the Hill. But they also watch it do basic. And there's a tape, you know, a software a, you know, tape to doing basic. And they copy it, and they make you know 70 copies and give it away for free, stealing, and to use Bill Gates's word, his software program. Because this is where you get the tension between software wanting to be free and that open source thing versus, for the first time, somebody says, because the women who did COBOL didn't do this, he says, Paul Allen and Bill Gates doing business as micro-soft, and they wanted to be able to have a copyright on it. Or, and, um, so intellectual so, property versus open source. Right, and you have his famous letter to the Homebrew Computer Club, said what you're doing is theft. Um, but also, at that meeting, I mean, this is like huge. It's a great movie scene, if anybody wants to make a movie of this book. Because sitting there is <laughs> Steve Wozniak, who thinks personal computers are stupid. He, he's building terminals that connect to mainframes. But then, he looks at this, and he looks at the specs for the Intel 8088, which is what allowed this to happen. He says, I can make something better. I can make it that connects to a monitor. So he does. And he does the specs for it, and he brings it to the next meeting of the homebrew employee with a TV that's carried by his friend from down the street, Steve Jobs. And Waz hands out for free to every, because, you know, he's... He kind of, he, he was communal. He's read the whole Earth catalog once too often. And he's like giving away the Apple, the, the design. It's not named yet. And finally, Steve Jobs, after a 
the second or third meeting says, wait a minute, we can go to my parents' garage and make these things and we can sell them and make money. And that's how Apple is born. So can out we of see that, that prototype, Josh, again, <laughs> Apple computer, and uh, I like that. That retro look is really nice. I think that's yeah. <laughs> Steve Jobs' design since pre Johnny Ive was uh, yeah retro. We didn't have the whiteness of the iPod back then, and so, uh, but we did by the time he does the Apple II. He, he wants yes, it to indeed, be sleek indeed. and beautiful. And and the story of Ive really is the story of beginning to think about computers not as detached objects that are independent of humans, but as things that can integrate even physically with humans. And the story of the mouse is the story of the ways in which computers suddenly began to integrate physically with the, with the, the poetry of the human body. Become intimate and right. connected to us. And in the book, I create two strands of thought. What I call the Ada Lovelace strand, which is computers and humans will become partners. We will work together in an intimacy, she says, a symbiosis like that. The other strand is the Alan Turing strand, which is we'll have artificial intelligence, machine learning, and they'll end up creating a singularity and work without us and, you know, have that sort of thing. Well, you know, people keep, and you'll have people on this stage talking about the singularity. You know, any decade you can have people doing it. Well, we haven't gotten anywhere near there yet, but what we keep getting leaps and bounds is this making the computer more intimate, creating the mouse. Ada Lovelace would love that, this symbiosis, putting it on our wrists, putting it on our glass. Uh, just the guy, somebody here, I was, you know, helped me figure out Google Glass today from the Google uh, site here, and it's like, oh. We may have a toy for you later. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I hope, a, I hope an old Pong game, because I'm... Well, we have that. We definitely have that. It's right But here. anyway, I just, I mean, without overdoing it, I think the intimacy that you're talking about really makes it and cool. And that's, that's the first mouse. That's Doug Engelbart's mouse. Uh, Doug Engelbart is another unsung hero uh, who's in this book a lot. He, people like him and Alan Kay, who do the graphical user, user interface at Xerox Park, uh, learn to make it, there's old Alan Kay, learn to make it so that these computers are friends, convivial. They used words like that as opposed to singularity. And they do it by reversing the math. In a sense, what made uh, Space War was the computer output going to the screen in mathematical dots, what they did was that same signal can come off a ball mm -hmm. rolling around with a sensor. You send that into the computer, the computer doesn't care what it is. It, it says, oh, I, I get it, and can turn that into directionality on a screen, and boom, you, you can you go know, both directions. You, and what you have, and Alan Kay and others do it too, is a whole lot of things come together that you don't think are that important, but they connect the art to the technology. You do that with something called bit mapping, which means every, you know, when you and I were growing up and talking about our K pros and stuff, there were those horrible phosphorus green letters on dark yep, screen. Yep. And what the computer would do to save power is to generate a letter, not to generate a V and it'd be up there. What Alan Kay, Doug Engelbart, and others figured out is that every pixel on the screen can be turned on and off, or for that matter, any color, if you have enough computing power. By this point, Gordon Moore has told us it will double every 18 months or so. So they create the mouse, bit mapping, graphical user interfaces, and Steve Jobs, who has dropped out of college and everything else, the one course he really loves and he takes, even though he's not actually enrolled in college, is calligraphy. So the first thing he does when he sees bit mapping, he says, I can make it do beautiful fonts. Everybody else is saying, who cares about beauty, beautiful fonts? Steve's great insight was beauty matters. And fonts is a hard problem. Yeah. Making fonts is a hard problem. And if you can solve fonts, you can basically create any kind of graphical representation. The amazing thing that is almost the exuberation of the personal computer is when he unveils the Macintosh. He's taken from Xerox Park, the notion of graphics, and he pulls the bag out from over it and he starts writing, hello, I'm Macintosh in script like that, and people gasp. It's cool. And it's part of this sort of convergence of our animation sense that we will suspend disbelief. Once it does that, that's a human talking to us. That's a creature, that's a being, that's not a machine so it's much. Convivial. It's, it's convivial, it's personal, it's personal. If you have to look at another trajectory of the digital age, it gets more, everything gets more and more personal. 
You put it in your pocket by the end, or you put it on your wrist. And you talked about, too, the video games, which are very, because they come along at the same time. You know, you're doing Space War, and they're doing the same time that Licklider, J.C.R. Licklider is another amazing character, is doing an air defense system. And so they have to have really fast interactive computing. So that notion that it's fun, it's interactive, it's very graphical, and it responds to you, comes up from everything from the consoles that the uh, air defense jockeys had to use at the SAGE system, and they're doing it at MIT and all, and so the people at MIT and the Tech Model Railway Club are also saying, okay, and we can make space war out of it, and it, it all comes together. And Steve Jobs worked the night shift at Atari. This and that's is his Bushnell's group. And yeah, Nolan Bushnell, owned it. Al Alcorn is the engineer of that. Steve Jobs come in, comes in, and he had just um, dropped out of college and gone to India and found his guru. So he comes back, and he eats only vegetables, but no grain, no meat, fruits and vegetables, fruitarian diet. And he tells Al Alcorn, uh, if you have this diet, you don't have to use deodorant. And Alcorn told me that was a mistaken theory, so I put him on the night shift. So, <laughs> so he and Waz are working at the night shift, and they, one of the first things they do is a single-player version of Pong called Breakout. And um, I, you know, I asked Steve, what did you learn you know, from video games besides the beauty and the pixel, all that sort of thing? He said, you really have to keep it simple. Uh, space... War when they first do it at Atari, they take the space war game from MIT and try. Right. It has, you know, in gravity there's no space. You have to use there's like eight instructions. In that game, there was just one instruction, which was avoid uh, missing ball for high score, which is a slightly garbled sentence, but a stone freshman yeah, yeah, can yeah. figure it out after midnight. Yeah, you know, yeah. you don't need a manual. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, shift to uh, the internet. Part of the innovation of the internet itself comes from figuring out how to take data and transmit it. And in the same way that bit mapping is the key insight to creating graphics that are uh, both uh, flexible and also beautiful, uh, uh, packet uh, transmission is the key insight to uh, transmitting data because the, the sort of initial notion would be the mail where you, oh, you take the message, you put it into a box, and then you send the box. And of course, messages are gonna be different sizes and all the boxes will be different sizes and there's all sorts of complexity associated with that. Just work at UPS and you understand the problems there. Um, but packet delivery was really something amazing and it had a difficult sell in the beginning. Absolutely, and packet switching breaks it into just a small little things, puts a, you know, a, a d very small finite block, puts a header on it, breaks up the entire message uh, as if you took a whole long letter and put it into 50 postcards and let them each follow a different route with instructions on how to reassemble Yeah, them. package yeah. delivery is like, will you stand up, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh-oh. All right, stand right up here on the stage. Uh-oh. All right, so let's say we're going to send him yeah. through the internet, right? Yeah. What we would do is basically we'd saw off his hand and a piece of his arm and his shoulder and his head and his foot and maybe the other arm all into little packets. And on those packets would be the name of him, yeah. right? And uh, the uh, place that it connects to. Right. Those two things plus whatever it is that's in your hand, arm, shoulder, head that we've uh, hacked off. And so... All the pieces would come apart, right? They'd zoom through data. I mean, your hand would take a different route than your foot. Your head would take a, yeah. your, your head might go a little slower, <laughs> um, possibly. Uh, and, and then you'd be reassembled very, very quickly. And the instructions for reassembly is contained within each individual packet. Yes, and that has a very important philosophical thing. First of all, you can, I assume you can sit, sit down, down that's right. yeah. Yeah. or you can be tra teleported to wherever you're going next. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Don't try that at home. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things that, that that does. You talk about UPS or FedEx, or for that matter, the phone company, which keeps a circuit open the entire time you're having a conversation. So that means they're central hubs, which means it can be controlled by authority. It means, you know, somebody can decide what goes through that hub. A Comcast can be in charge of pack, whatever it may be. But a packet switch, every single node has just as much ability to store and forward a packet. And therefore, if some node gets knocked out or somebody does something, tries to censor things, the internet routes around it. This has two 
functions. One is that Paul Barron, who is one of the founders of packet switching out at Rand Corporation, now there's Donald Davies in England and then a few others, he's doing it to help survive a nuclear attack. If the Russians hit our communication system, he wants America to be able to retaliate, which is actually a good thing because it prevents us from wanting to do a first strike. and makes us less hair trigger. It means trigger. you have to distribute the data. It means that you have to have no centralized hub that they can attack. Right. And if they hit 50 different places, they'll still, you know, those little packets will scurry around the spider's web and route around it. So that's the reason he does it. He explains it to the Bell system and AT&T over and over again. They say it won't work. They finally bring him for four days of seminars where they bring 90 experts explaining to him why, instead of having a dedicated circuit, packet switching won't work. And they say, do you understand this now? And he goes, no. And um, he's right. They're wrong, which is why the Bell system never built the Internet. Um, but the really cool thing is the people who did end up building it the ARPANET, this is, because it starts off as a Defense Department project, are um, the research centers that the Defense Department is funding. And being research centers, they delegate it to their graduate students to figure out how to do the protocols. The graduate students are all graduate students indefinitely because they're avoiding the Vietnam War. And so they're staying in graduate school as long as they can. They are trying to help the Pentagon survive a nuclear attack. They want to build a system that can't be censored, can't be controlled, can't have a top-down authority. So they create this decentralized or distributed system of the Internet. The cool thing is, I have a section in the book on, was it to help survive a nuclear attack? And half the people say no. Half the, and so there's a guy, Steve Lukasic, who was high up in the Pentagon and funding this. He finally says to Steve Crocker, who's one of the young graduate students, you don't really know because uh, you were on the bottom and I was on top, so I know why it was developed. And Crocker said, no, you don't really know. You were on the top, I was on the bottom, <laughs> so you have no clue. Which is the perfect specification. Right, and now that DNA, that the finger, the sort of into the genetic code is inbred the notion of we route around authority. And that uh, distributed system architecture also creates the other huge advantage that a packet uh, switching system delivers, and that is scalability, yeah. infinite scalability. Without scalability... Everybody can be a node on the Internet. Right. There are a few people who object to allowing their computers to be used, to basically be hijacked in little sort of bit packages mm -hmm. for this distributed system. Can you describe that? Yeah, you know, I think what you may be referring to is I wrestled with the fact that the people who invented the personal computer and first had it, the hobbyists, the hackers, the phone freakers, um, they really wanted something personal. Alan Cave in at Xerox Park, you could take it out to the woods. It was a personal creativity device. So the personal computer arising in the 70s, is arising at the same time as the ARPANET, and then the ARPANET, there's other networks that come along, so they have to internetwork them, which is why we get the phrase internet. Um, but they're separate, because the people using the internet you know, want to sort of share each other's computers, and the people who are creating the personal computer want to go off in the woods and you know, do whatever they do with computers. Um, wow, that's like it, a book. <laughs> it takes a while... In fact, I didn't get this at first. I was going to do this as a history of the Internet. And it was Gates when I interviewed him who said, no, you don't get it. In the 70s is where all of a sudden the networking and the personal computer come together in modems, online services. And that is like the steam engine coming together with mechanical processes to create the Industrial Revolution. It's that combustible combination that creates a digital revolution.